Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 1997 to 1999 animated series or miniseries, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Now, this is a spectacular, stunning, and absolutely amazing series. This is Spawn done the right way. This is dark. This is disturbing. This is violent. This is edgy. It's everything that Spawn is, and then some. Uh, the 1997 film really does not do the comics justice or the character because it half-asses it. It tries to make the character appeal to a wider audience, so it censors it. It censors the character. It takes away a lot of the darkness, a lot of the hard horror elements of Spawn, which made Spawn so appealing to a lot of people because it was a horror... Type is essentially it was a horror superhero, and there really weren't a lot of those type of superheroes in comics at the time. So Spawn was a comic that was not afraid to go for the jugular, and this series definitely does that. Uh, this is one of the most impressive adult animated series that I've seen. To be honest, I I really think it is right up there with the best animated series out there including things like Batman the Animated Series, Justice League, Justice League Unlimited, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a show that I really do feel holds up. It holds up really well. Uh, there are some things about it that don't hold it that well, and I'll talk about those soon enough. But for the most part, it holds up really well. It's uh, well written. It's got fantastic voice, that voice acting. I mean, really... Um, noteworthy voice acting everyone who lends their voice talents to this show really does give it their all and it shows and you can tell that there's passion behind this project and you got some really talented people who worked on the show you have a uh, one of the show's producers one of the show the show's creative consultants was a, a man who was heavily involved with batman the animated series so and he uh, ended up joining the crew of Spawn a little bit later uh, during its run, and he did it because he wanted to, because he was he jumped at the opportunity to join uh, the crew of Spawn so he can live a dream that he had of working on a show, an animated show that was intended for adults. As great as Batman the animated series is, it's not intended for adults it's not a tvma series so he jumped at the opportunity to play in the sandbox and jump out of his comfort zone and create something that is just disturbing and dark but brilliant at the same time so yeah a lot of talented people worked on this show uh to help animate it uh in the second and third seasons there was an animation company that worked on akira and a few other uh animated uh series at the time as well as anime uh, worked on uh, the series the, f the series definitely does have a anime influence there's a lot of shading and a lot of different uh, things about the animation that does harken back to anime and it works really well uh, with the plots and with the storylines and with the action in, in the series and with the flow of the animation and, and definitely the darker look of, of, of the series. It, it, does, it does mix really well. This mix of Japanese anime with traditional uh, American animation. This was a pretty risky undertaking for HBO. Because they weren't really known for doing animation. And this is one of, one of their lone successes. Sadly... They didn't really get another hit for their HBO animation uh, spinoff uh, of their company. They did a, a series called Spicy City that was created by Ralph Bakshi, which I think is interesting, but not quite on the same level as Spawn. But they never really had another series that was anywhere near as successful as this series was. And that's too bad because there's so much potential for HBO to just branch off and do so much with the animation brand. 
So Tom McFarlane Spawn, it aired from 1997 to 1999. There were three seasons. Uh, it, it's considered a miniseries by some, and then by others it's just considered an animated series. And I think you, you could make an argument that it's both, because all three seasons have a continuing story arc. It's meant to be seen as a cohesive whole. Uh, each season has a story story arc that connects with the next one. It, it's it's a series that, in order to really appreciate it and really to uh, get all of it, you have to watch the entire series. Uh, you can't just watch like one or two episodes. And it, it's not one of those anthology type series. It's a, a continuing story arc throughout the entire show. And that's that's one of the uh, definitely one of the most impressive things about the show is that it manages to do that really well. And that's not easy to do with animation or, or a TV series to begin with. There are some things that it could have done a little bit better. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about more of the episodes a little bit more in depth. But to be honest, I still think it does a great job with its storytelling. So I, I, I mean, I would have liked to have seen more uh, at the end of the series uh, or another continuation. But f with what you have and with how it ends, it's satisfying enough. Now, the, the series is developed by Alan B. Mc McElroy, who, interestingly enough, also wrote the script and helped work on the story for the 1997 live action film by New Line. And when you look at his work on that, and then you look at his work here, it's night and day. It really is. It's like, why could he have not taken the just perfect approach that he had for this character of Spawn and for this world and brought it to a live action film? And I, I think a large part of that is because the studio was trying to make more money. PG-13, get more people to see the film. Uh, Spawn had a pretty successful uh, audience of teens who really liked the comics. So it's one of those things where I guess they felt that they made it PG-13, then it would appeal to more people and make more money. It did okay in the box office, but it didn't light the box, box office on fire. And unlike... Uh, the 1997 film that this series does have a lasting legacy and it's a positive legacy. It's when a lot of people talk about Tom McFarlane spawn, they definitely do think highly of this show. I mean, it was ranked fifth on IGN's list of the greatest comic book cartoons of all time. It was 23rd on IGN's list of top 25 primetime animated series of all time. And it's been on a lot of other people's lists. It even was nominated for an Emmy in 1999 for Outstanding Animation Program, and it won that award. So this is an Emmy award-winning animated series. So this is a show that definitely has a lot of clout and a lot of pred pedigree. But I do feel that it is underrated, because there's not a lot of people who talk about the show nowadays. It seems to be forgotten about, left on the wayside, put on the back burner... And I really definitely think that this is a series that should be revisited by fans or by, or by people who are curious about Spawn or just like good storytelling and good animation or uh, a really engrossing comic book uh, series. I definitely do feel that more people should discover this, especially since there's going to be a new Spawn film that's going to be coming out uh, by Blumhouse with Tom, Todd McFarlane working on it. And... So it's one of those series that I definitely do feel should get a release on Blu-ray. I would love to see this on Blu-ray. HBO is not known for really doing that much. Surprised they even did something like this. Now, that being said, I do have some uh, bones to pick with this particular set. And I'll talk about that pretty much at the end of this video. Because I don't really want to intersperse my gr personal gripes towards uh, a box set of mine into a review of the series but anyway yeah alan b McElroy helped develop the series there's a bunch of different other writers who worked on uh, each episode um you had uh, and different directors as well who directed uh, different episodes of the series it features a phenomenal voice cast 
you have Keith David who plays Spawn slash Al, Al Simmons in the role that he was born to play. He is the Keith Conroy. I mean, he's the Kevin Conroy. Sorry, I get Keith Conroy. He might as well be because he, he is the Kevin Conroy of this series. What Kevin Conroy is to Batman, Keith David is to Spawn. Uh, I cannot think of Spawn as being Michael J. White anymore. I think of him as being Keith David. He did a absolutely... I'm just trying to think of the right word because I, I keep using a lot of different words like excellent and he did he did an awesome job playing this character and he embraced this character and his struggles and his grief and his anger and his sadness. It's it's a tour de force when it comes to voice acting. Richard Dysart did a solid job too as Cal Gostro, who narrates a lot of the episodes uh, Michael Nicolosi, I thought was way better than, uh, John Leguizamo as the clown because he dialed it down and, uh, the character wasn't farting all the time and being a total annoying pest. Uh, James Haynes did all right to his violator in the demon form and overkill. It's like, he's not really doing a lot of serious voice acting, but does a good job with the, the sound effects and things like that. Dominique Jennings was good as Wanda Blake. Jennifer Jason Lee was uh, fine as Lily. I personally felt, though, that Lily, I don't know, the character was was decent, but I just, I, I was, I really felt this series was missing Angela. She shows up in, in like, one of the episodes and then never shows up again for the rest of the series. And uh, Denise Poirier, who voiced Angela, voices one of the bounty hunters who show up in the in the third season so i'm like why why isn't angela involved in this more because she was a big part of the comic the comic book so it's one of those like that's a little bit disappointing there are two different actors who played uh, terry fitzgerald you had uh, victor love who played terry in the first 12 episodes and then you had michael beach who played terry in episodes 15 through 17 um they were very interchangeable. I would argue Michael Beach was a little bit better than Victor Love, but Victor Love wasn't terrible or anything. You have Caff Susie, who you might recognize because she's done a lot of different voice at work for a lot of different things. She uh, voiced uh, Lola Bunny in Space Jam, and she voices uh, the daughter of Wanda Blake and Terry Fitzgerald, Cyan. And... Michael McShane has a, a nice role as Twitch, uh, as well as, um, I'm trying to think of the, oh yeah, Burke, Sam Burke is voiced by James Keen and John Rafter Lee, who voiced, uh, one of the, I voiced, I think he voiced a villain in Aeon Flux. He is pitch perfect as Jason Wynn. He just exudes evil and sleaze and just rich entitled asshole ronnie cox also lends his voice talents to this as a corrupt senator as well as the senator's psychotic son who is uh, an ice cream man who lures kids and rapes and murders them yeah this 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 is some heavy shit this does not fuck around and uh, you even have Robert Forster from Alligator and a few other things. He voices Major Forsberg, who was uh, Al's former major that was a, a guy who was an uh, inspiration to Al and one of the few things that really kept him uh, connected to humanity at the time. And there's a few other actors as well. I mean, you even have James Hong, who lends his voice talents to the character of Jen Soon and Zhang Lao, and you have uh, Ming Na, who voices the character Jade. So, yeah, voice voice cast is uh, easily right up there with the best when it comes to uh, an animated series, and they're so good at what they do. They elevate the film. I mean, they elevate the series. It's not, they elevate the series to cinematic quality, really, because of how good they are at uh, 
bringing these characters to life. And it's not easy to do that with just your voice to act and to embody these characters with your voice and not with your actions and, and not with your on camera persona. It also features a, a score by Shirley Walker, Graham Ravel, as well as J. Peter Robinson. And with all of those people involved, with Shirley Walker, Graham Ravel, you think it would be an epic, amazing score. And it really isn't, which is very disappointing. It's one of the few things about this series that I thought was a letdown. It's definitely the score. It adds atmosphere and mood to the series, but it's not really memorable. It's just there. I felt J.P. Robinson uh, put more of an effort and did more and had more variety with the score when he took over for season three. But Shirley Walker's score was just the same beats. And it's disappointing considering she did such a great job with Batman the Animated Series. So... Yeah, it's, that's definitely disappointing, the score. But in Graham Ravel, he's a great composer too. But it's just a lot. Of, there's not really a lot of notes to this score that really stands out and, and really sticks with you. It's just kind of background noise, which is definitely disappointing. Uh, it lasted for three seasons, and but only 18 episodes. So each... Each season is six episodes long with a running time of, a, of about 30 minutes. Now, if you take away some few things here and there, it's about 25 or 30 minutes long. Now, the series premiered on HBO on May 16th, 1997, and it ended on HBO on May 28th, 1999. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the... Seasons. I'm going to go down the line, I'm going to talk about season one, get my quick thoughts on each episode, and then do the same for uh, seasons two and three, and then give my final thoughts in the series. And rant a little bit on this box set that I, that I have. So season one, it, it starts out with a really bang, a total banger of a pilot episode it has some of my most favorite visuals from this series when al digs up his corpse and his corpse comes to life and starts telling him that you 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 dumbass you made a deal with the devil you made a deal with malbolgia uh it, it's a very striking visual there's a lot of those in this series and uh so it, it starts out right off the bat with a very powerful memorable first episode that is absolutely better than the movie i mean that 30 minute episode is better than the entirety of the 1997 live action film the second episode so the first episode is the first episode is called burning visions uh deals with al simmons returning from the grave lost and bewildered at how his wife wanda is now married to his best friend terry he's followed by the clown violator who reveals that al has been dead for five years and is now his hell spawn meanwhile jason Wynn and tony twist are trying to figure out how to move out their illegal arms. So there's just a little bit of a synopsis. There's more to the episode than that, but I don't really want to give away that much. Just uh, be prepared for some really awesome visuals and some great voice acting and some really uh, uh, spectacular, excellent storytelling and, and uh, screenwriting as well. I don't know if it's screenwriting or teleplay. That's probably a better way to put it now what i like about this series also is it definitely does follow the comics more in the 1997 film they weren't able to really show his origins as, as close to a t as uh this was able to do and they incorporate the character chapel who then uh, was not in the 1997 live action film because of <clears throat> because of rights issues yeah uh, because uh the character was owned by Rob Liefeld and he did not sign over permission for New Line to be able to have the character on film. So he's replaced by uh, this other character, Priest, uh, a female mercenary who's working for Jason Wynn. Now, you have the second episode, which is directed by John Hayes and written by Alan B. McElroy. 
It deals with Spawn being tormented by the thought that he can't be with his wife. Uh, he's annoyed by the clown's efforts to drive him into violence and to start sending souls to hell. He eventually engages in a brawl with the clown's demonic alter ego, the Violator, which is a really cool sequence. And throughout this whole first season, Spawn finds sanctuary in a shanty town of sorts where you have all these homeless people are staying and living there. So it becomes a protector of the of this alley. And um, he, anytime there's these criminals or these other people who try to come in the alley and try to start some shit, Spawn comes in and protects the people of the alley. And it shows you that he definitely does still have a heart, even though he's this living corpse with these abilities and this armor that he's been given by hell. Now, like I said in, in my review of the 1997 live-action film, I felt that the, the film did not really do the best job capturing the character of Spawn, who is this combination of Darkman and Batman and the similar sort of way. You know, it's, it's like, what if you had a character like Peyton Westlake who had this super suit that enabled him to do all these things, but he's tortured and he's tormented and... He isn't able to reunite with his wife because he's this walking crispy zombie underneath all of this hell armor, all, all underneath all of this hellish armor and this cloak and all of this. He's become something completely inhuman. Um, and there's a lot of sympathy for, for Al Simmons, even though he's done some pretty awful shit in his life. He's not perfect. You still can't help but feel for him because he ulti he didn't do good and, you know, all the time, but he still had a good heart and you want to see him redeem himself. And that's a core element of this series, especially in the first season. It's all about Al Simmons's redemption and all about him choosing the right side. So he, it's all about him choosing the side of good over the side of evil siding with heaven instead of hell. So, yeah, in episode two, there's a great battle between Spawn and the Violator. Uh, episode three is called No Rest, No Peace. It deals with a hitman who's hired by Tony Twist called Overkill, who is hired to kill Spawn because Spawn has been taken out of his guys in the alleys. Uh, Tony Twist's men are trying to get some deals done, they're trying to do stuff in the alleys, and Spawn put a stop to that in bloody fashion. That's definitely something about the show that really does stand out, and in a good way. It's very refreshing to watch nowadays when you see a lot of animated series that really don't go for the ballsy approach of showing you blood, violence, and carnage. Uh, Spawn definitely does show that, but it does it in a stylistic way, and it doesn't show too much. That's something I really like about this series is that it doesn't overdo it and it knows when to keep Spawn in the shadows and knows when to keep his actions mysterious and to let your mind come up with what happens to these people, which honestly is more horrifying than what, what you can see on screen. So, And it also makes Spawn a much more intimidating presence because you don't get desensitized with his actions and with this character and, and how he hides in the shadows and lashes out against people against evil really so he's using these weapons of evil that he's been given to fight evil which honestly is a great concept it really is spawn was a genuinely unique and a uh, great idea and this series does really it really does milk that idea and and does it in a good way it gives it milks it milks it and gives you some delicious uh milk out of it not it doesn't give you spoiled milk because it doesn't milk it too much. So, and even when he battles the Overkill, you don't actually, see, you see the first battle and Spawn actually gets it, gets in a, quite a uh, rough predicament. And then after, but I think that's actually in episode two is when Overkill shows up and starts fighting him. But in episode three, uh, Overkill gets killed by Spawn later when he gets his weapons and just takes them out. And so Wynn then sends in Chapel, the original uh, guy who killed 
Spawn to try to get the job done, but you don't really see the battle between Chapel and Spawn until the second season. Episode four is called Dominoes. It's directed by John Hayes, and this is where you're you get more background for the detectives Sam Burke and Twitch Williams. And I love these characters. They're great. They have wonderful chemistry, and they're trying to trail this child killer known as Billy Kincaid who poses as an ice cream man and there's a connection between Kincaid and the senator because Kincaid is the senator's son and the senator is bought is been bought out by Jason Wynn and Jason Wynn wants him to run for congress so he can have more power and Wanda learns of some more some evidence that will help her client because she's a lawyer be cleared of his charges and because he's been charged with murder because he's been the one that's been tagged with some of these killings. And that opens up a rabbit hole that she eventually falls into. So there's all these different uh, things that are being put in place for the rest of the series. Throughout this first season. Which is easily the strongest season out of this series. I'm not saying season 2 and 3 are bad. It's just season 1 is so good. It's such a great series. I mean, it's such a great season, it's a hard act to follow. But the other two seasons are still really solid and still really entertaining, well thought out, well written, and well made seasons. With some amazing animation and great voice work and some really engaging, dark, and powerful storytelling. So. Episode 5 is called Souls in the Balance. It's uh, written by Gary Hardwick. And it deals with uh, Spawn trying to take out this crazed priest. Cra- a crazed priest. Because <laughs> he's this guy who doesn't die. And meanwhile you find out that this priest is not, who you th- is not even human anyway. It's just a violator taking the form of a human and doing all these horrible things in the name of God. And... The clown then tips off the location of Wanda and Terry's daughter, Cyan, to Kincaid, which uh, leads to the final episode of the first season where there's a confrontation between Spawn and uh, Kincaid. Spawn saves Cyan from Kincaid and returns her to her parents along with the uh, the wedding ring that Al Simmons was buried with. Uh, Frustrated that Spawn cannot kill Kincaid, clown does... And promises to continue pursuing the hell spawn. And it, yeah, it just sets all, all of the events in, in, in motion for the rest of the series. And this is a, a really nice conclusion of the first season because it gives you closure. Spawn chooses, finally chooses what side he's going to be on. And that's when season two comes along and kind of fucks some shit up, which is honestly disappointing. I like season two. But I, I I don't like the entire season. I, I feel things kind of started to go off the rails here. The first two episodes are great. I really love them. I think they're fantastic. I, I really I, some of my favorite moments in the series are from episodes seven and eight. Uh, you have Home Bitter Home, which is directed by Jennifer U. Nelson. Written by Larry Brody, John Shirley, John Leakley, and Rebecca Bradford. Uh, this is where Chapel shows up and has his first confrontation well, with Spawn. They have an encounter uh, that ends up shaking the alleyways, and it's epic, and it's great. And I love how Spawn dispatches of Chapel. He doesn't kill him. He touches his head and gives him all the memories of what he did to Al and what ultimately became of Al because of his actions because he killed Al and he got sent to hell and then Al was eventually brought back as a hell spawn and then he pretty much drives him nuts and and Chapel is seeing things he's seeing his victims that he's killed coming back to life and he's begging spawn to kill him and no he's like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not gonna kill you I'm gonna let, let you suffer you know, it's like, damn, like that's so cold. It's such a heartless way to um, take somebody out, but it's a really great way to. I noticed though, season two, 
the tone really started to shift. It got extremely dark. And I understand why, but at times it didn't quite work because it started to unravel what was done in the first season. Uh, episode 8, though, doesn't really do that. Episode 8 uh, deals with, it's directed by Tom Nelson, and it's written by, also written by Larry Brody, John Shirley, John Leakley, and Rebecca Bradford. Uh, Terry discovers more than he should about these shipping discrepancies uh, over at Wynn's headquarters. Wynn orders a hit on his life. Spawn ends up saving his life. Um, eventually, because he eventually, because he wants to kill Terry, because he thinks that Terry stole Wanda from him. But actually, that's not what happened at all. He learns the truth, and then he fights off Terry's attackers and saves them. And saves Terry. Some really nice uh, bits of action in this one. And overall I, I thought it was a really strong episode. Uh, from season 2. Now season 3 is where when it really falls off the rails. It's called Colors of Blood. It's directed by Mike Vosberg. Written by Larry Brody, John Shirley, and Victor Bombalo. Uh, this is a this is where the ton tone shifts to a point where it doesn't really work that well. Uh, t uh, Spawn try. Oh, actually, Wynn tries to find Terry and kill him because he's hitmen. Uh, we're not able to do that because Spawn ended up taking them out. Uh, Wynn then turns to Wanda to try to get her, so he she, so he can uh, end up flushing Terry out in the process and take them both out because he's found out that they're both trying to find information about win and his arms deals and all this other shady shit that he's been doing and while that's going on spawn is moping around in the alleys being all like woe is me my life sucks i can't be with wanda he's not doing anything there's these local drug dealers who have come into the alleys and they've started taking over and there's been people in the out there's been uh, citizens of, of this uh, shanty town who have been killed and they, they've they been waiting for Spawn to save them because he's their guardian and he's sitting on his ass and he's not doing anything and eventually though he does get out of his mope fest and takes out the drug dealers and it's it's pretty cool but it's one of those it's like for fuck's sake it doesn't match with the story it does not. It ends up unraveling everything that was set up in End Games in Episode Six, where he chose a side, and here he is. He's like, oh, "I'm just gonna let them die. I don't care. I don't care about anybody." It's it's just like this emo bullshit, and I, I did not care for that. There's some great animation, and there's some nice kills, and there's some nice elements to this, but the storytelling seriously lacks. And it hurts, and honestly starts to hurt the entire series, because it goes back on its word. And then you're like, well, what is it trying to do now? It's, it's a, why are we going backwards? The Spawn already moped enough in the first season. Then you have episode 10, which is called Send in the KKK Clowns, directed by Jennifer U. Nelson, and written by John Leakley and Gerard Brown. This one has this, it, it, this is really dark. Like, this is pitch black. There's this serial killer who claims to be doing the Lord's work. And he's killing off black people. And, but he ends up finding one that he captured, uh, Terry. And he's more than he can handle because Spawn ends up intervening and uh, takes out the serial killer and kills him the same way that the killer likes to kill his victims. He hangs him. Spawn attempts to confront Wanda at one point, point in time, but he only frightens her. Uh, I thought that was a nice moment where he tries to confront her, but she's all terrified of, of him. Understandably so, because Spawn, with his cloak and everything, is pretty scary. And I would say it was, an, it was better than the previous episode, but the tone was still really, really dark. And almost to the point where it was a little bit too dark. Then you have episode 11 called Death Blow, which is read by Tom Nelson and written by John Leakley, Rebecca Bradford, and Gerard Brown. This has a <clears throat> reporter named Lisa Wu who's looking into uh, the recent alley murders, and this is where Spawn then ends up 
visiting Wanda at home and scares her again. There's more character building moments there. <clears throat> Death Blow really felt like a, I don't know, it was kind of a filler episode. It was, it was there. There were some nice moments, but there wasn't really a lot to it. Episode two directed, I mean, episode 12 is called Hell's a Poppin'. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> For some reason, I'm just either running out of uh, energy or my voice is, is going. I don't know. I'm going to try to, I'm definitely going to try to get through this because maybe you might take a break and then you might see a little bit of an edit because um, I'll go get something to drink real quick or something like that. But anyway, uh, episode 12 is called Hell's a Pop and it's directed by Mike Vosberg. It's, star, it's written by John Leakley, Rebecca Bradford, and Gerard Brown. This is a really effective finale to season two. This has some of the best action sequences in the series. There's some really great gunfights in this and gunplay. Uh, this deals with uh, the... Basically, what's happening is Wynn is getting pushed out of his position of power by the FBI. He watches the news. He sees a message from the clown uh, pretty much telling him that stuff's going to go down and that he's going to be uh, a prime a free agent for hell. Uh, realizing that Wynn had sent people to bo kill both Cyan and Wanda... Spawn then goes in and threatens to kill Wynn if he doesn't back off. And he does so in this epic way where he takes out all these soldiers and stuff inside of Wynn's complex. And you, you, I can't even describe it uh, to, enough to do it justice. You have to see it to really appreciate it and really enjoy it. And just to really just be like, wow, like that's some great animation. That's some really great action. So it's a great, it's a, it's a, so yeah, I mean, there are a couple episodes that I eh, wasn't too big on. There's one that I didn't like at all uh, for the most part, but then there's uh, a, a few episodes in season two. that are some of the strongest in the series. Hell's a Poppins has some of the best action, uh, home, bitter home access denied, access denied, or some really solid, spectacular episodes. So yeah, season two is strong. It's not not as strong as the first, but it's still it's still packs quite a punch. Now let's talk about the third and final season of the series. Starts out with episode thirteen, which is called "The Mind Killer," which is directed by Jennifer U. Nelson and written by John Leakley. It's centered around Spawn feeling sorrowful and feeling regretful about major forsberg and what ended up happening to him and calagostro is trying to get him to give up the shroud and essentially trying to get spawn to choose a side which is like it's it's kind of it is a little bit derivative especially when you have the first season is all about him choosing a side second season He's gone backwards and is just, you don't really know where he stands. Maybe he's going to go for hell or maybe he's going to go for heaven. Uh, but I still feel season three, even though there are some derivative things here, it does some really interesting stuff. So it has, um, he tries to get him to give it the shroud and it talks about some history of the hell spawns gives you some backstory on Kyle Gostro and how he used to be a hell spawn himself, uh, how he was the black knight. So th that there's some interesting uh, aspects that are definitely brought up and interesting parts of the overarching story that are, that is um, brought up in this uh, particular segment i mean not segment a particular episode of the se of the third season and also this is where win really becomes a really dangerous villain because before he was kind of limited by some things but now like he's unleashed and he's he's essentially a uh, criminal he was a criminal before but now he's on the streets and now he is become even more deranged and dangerous and he's got hell on his side Episode 14 is called Twitch is Down, and it's one of my favorite episodes of uh, this season. 
It deals with Twitch Williams, who is investigating the Alley murders. He confronts Spawn and asks him about asks him, asks him about what happened. Twitch learns too much about the Alley murders, and Jason Wynn sends uh, the dirty police chief to kill Twitch and to keep him silenced. But Twitch ends up surviving. Number f- episode 15 is called Seed of the Hellspawn. It's directed by Mike Vosberg and written by John Leakley. This is where Spawn learns how to use his shroud. He realizes he, c- he can use his shroud to take on the form of other people. He knows that returning as Al would potentially devastate Wanda. So he disguises himself as Terry. He makes love with his wife one last time. But... He also unwittingly ends up fulfilling a prophecy in the process. Because the whole plan from the beginning, you find out, was not that he would lead Hell's army. It would be that he would impregnate uh, a human woman with the Antichrist, pretty much. So he unwillingly ends up completing Hell's plan and starting uh, the clock for Armageddon which you see this there's like a clock that you see repeatedly throughout uh, the series well at least I, I think it might have been at least in the first or second seasons I don't I think it's also in the third season as well and so he uses a form the shroud to take on the form of Terry makes love to his wife one last time Sam is what is dealing with twitch getting hospitalized and this is now where Banks is choosing to frame Spawn as the one that shot Twitch. So now Banks wants to kill Spawn. Then you have episode 16, which is called Hunter's Moon. It's directed by Jennifer U. Nelson and written by John Leakley. This is where you have Lily shows up, voiced by Jennifer Jason Lee. She's a succubus of some kind. She used to work for Heaven, but now she's gotten a deal with hell to try to take out spawn so she can get her place in heaven again i love how this series depicts that heaven and hell are not necessarily two polar opposites that heaven is willing to do some crazy shit in order to get the job done just as much as hell is so it blurs the lines and and i find that to be very ballsy and very innovative and definitely makes uh the heaven aspects of spawn very intriguing so he befriends her she attacks him though and then he pretty much just fries her ass in the sunlight takes her out pretty easily lisa Wu, the reporter then reveals herself to be jade this badass hunter who was also sent by heaven to kill hell spawn but she ends up allowing him to reheal himself after Lily almost completely. Lily did get a. Honestly, though, he did take care of her. He did fry her ass in sunlight, but she really did take a bite out of him. But Jade, because she sees that he has a heart, a good heart, she lets him live. Ties into episode 17, which is called Chasing the Serpent, which is directed by Chuck Patton and written by Rebecca Bradford. And this is where Spawn is aided by Jade, and they end up freeing Terry and Major Forsberg from Jason Wynn's opium prison in Chinatown. Now, Jason Wynn is also trying to get this uh, Chinese mask, the mask of Genghis Khan, so he can get, like, the powers of hell. And it doesn't end up working out too well. He puts it on, and it scars him. Uh, he looks a lot like Deadpool, actually, because he scars his his face, and he's, like, bald, and uh, scarred and wrinkly looking. He looks a lot like, uh, Wade Wilson, but he doesn't have a sense of humor that, or the charisma that Wade Wilson does. But anyway, um, or the healing factor. This is one of my favorite episodes of this season because there's some nice action bits with Jade. She really does kick some ass. She decapitates some motherfuckers and shit with her, uh, katanas. It's, it's really cool. And then the final episode is called Prophecy. And it's directed by Brad Rader and written by John Leakley. Jade realizes Spawn is not what she thought and decides to spare him. Uh, She spared him earlier. She already is is assuming that he's uh, more leaning towards the side of good and the side of the right instead of the side of hell. And Heaven responds by placing a bounty on her. 
she's mortally wounded by the new hunters who shoot her full of arrows and but she ends up avoiding disgrace and actually is able to go to heaven because spawn gives her a warrior's death sam and twitch then confront the chief in the subway because they have found out in earlier episodes of the chief because um Twitch ends up regaining his memory and remembers that it's the chief who's the one who shot him and the secure confession of him uh, from him before the last train leaves. And uh, it's pretty br and uh, the chief actually ends up shooting himself in a pretty intense sequence because they're all like, we're not going to take you in. You know, you have this option. You can put a bullet in your head, you know, or you can, or you can be taken in and be arrested and, you know deal with all of that and have your family uh, see you as a dirty cop but he ends up taking his life instead and uh, not only just that because win is going to come after him he was going to die anyway because win's going to take him out and then spawn ends the series with saying that he wants his humanity back so he's talking to cal gostro and he's like i want my humanity back and then the closing credits roll and that's it so it's a little bit of an anticlimax in some ways i have to admit but there are some loose ends that are definitely tied up for good this the the whole subplot that was uh, that was going around spinning around throughout this entire season with sam and twitch and uh the chief and the stuff with jade and spawn i maybe a little bit more action at times would have been nice i i also felt that this was a stronger season in terms of the balance of tone. Second season was super dark and almost to the point where it was almost comical at times because it was just way too dark. It was hard to believe. It was, it was unbelievably dark. And the first season wasn't really like that. And then this, the third season, it had a better balance. There was a great moment when Spawn gives his grandmother... Uh, Al gives his grandmother uh, something that she's been wishing for to speak with her husband one last time and that was really sweet so there's some really not um, really genuinely heartwarming moments in this in this season along with all the carnage and the darkness and the violence and the blood and all of that so it, it's 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 achieves a better balance between the light and the dark versus season two was just pretty much just dark and not much light at all. The ending though, I mean, it does, it leaves you wanting more and you don't get more. You don't get to see what happens after this. What is Spawn's son going to be like? What is that going to, what is the prophecy? Uh, how is Spawn going to get his humanity back? If he does get it back, it's called the, the, DVD release of this that is uh, this all the episodes from the season collected into a mini movie. It's called the Ultimate Battle. There really is no ultimate battle. He doesn't really fight. He he doesn't really fight the the forces of heaven. He kind of does, but really he doesn't really do that much. The mo the bounty hunters don't really take him out. They don't do that much. As soon as he gives Jade a warrior's death, um. But there, there, like I said, there's still definitely some worthy things. I, I think season three is a step up from season two, which was it, it wasn't as good as it could have been, but it was still above average. The first season was some of the best that I've seen with this type of comic book storytelling in an animated form. And season two was a step down, but season three was more of a return to form for the series. And, and, and it's really too bad that even though the series won an Emmy, it didn't get a fourth season. Why? It won an Emmy. It seemed to have decent ratings. and uh, But then that's that's it, I guess. Maybe Spawn, uh, the character wasn't as popular or something with uh, with audiences. I don't know. I don't know what it, what it is. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen more of an ultimate battle or something. Maybe him taking out Violator at least would have been a nice thing to see because he does, he doesn't really he wasn't really able to do that. And there were a few other things that were hinted at, but they didn't really kind of flesh it out. Like there was there was hints that maybe Billy Kincaid might come back, and then didn't really flesh that out too well. And 
the whole stuff with Win. I really would have liked to have seen a final confrontation between Spawn and Win. Um, you don't really get that. So there, there definitely are some things that are left on uh, questions that are left unanswered, and there are some moments that are missed uh, to end this series. I, it makes you think that they really had not planned on the third season being the last season. Uh, maybe it was canceled because it was expensive. Maybe that's why. I mean, maybe it's because it was just too expensive. Or maybe HBO didn't really want to be known as an animated uh, network because of the failure of Spicy City. I, I don't I don't know exactly what the, ki what the case is. It's one of those things where you'd have to be in the know. You'd have to be there at the time to really know what happened. I know there was rumors of a new series called Spawn the Animation, was gonna, which is going to follow up Season 3 and the events of the previous seasons, but nothing really came of it. I honestly would rather see that, like a Netflix series with similar animation style, with Keith David and a lot of the other cast members returning to voice the characters, but... It seems like that's not going to be in the works. Instead, it's going to be the Blumhouse film where Spawn's going to be on the sideline. It's going to be more about Twitch, and I don't know. And it's like a $10 million budget, and that means there's not they're not going to be really going to be able to do that much with Spawn because it's $10 million. They don't have that much to work with. They don't have that much of a budget to work with. The 1997 live-action film had a $40 million budget. So, yeah, it's one of those that's like, that's a definitely... Uh, something that I'm, I'm, I hope is good, but I don't have a lot of high hopes for the new Spawn. Now, before I go, um, I definitely want to mention this set. It looks great. It's a really cool uh, steel book, but I have some issues with this. Now, one of them is this: the way that it's set up. I would have liked to have seen separate flipper discs instead of what this is. Leaves this shit getting scratched. Um, but my main problem with this set is it's a crapshoot. I got this years ago at buybacks. And there's no way that I would have known that certain discs, certain discs, certain dicks, certain discs were being dicks. Uh, I would not have known that. Unless I started watching the series. So when I when I sat down and watched the series, disc one worked great. Disc two worked great until episode four, which wouldn't even play. And then episode five wouldn't play. Episode six wouldn't play. So, I mean, well, not really. I mean, episodes, not really episode five or six. I mean, more likely, I mean, episodes um, 10, 11, and 12 wouldn't play. And I even went into the play all option and tried to figure out a way to make them play that way. Didn't work. Then I popped in disc three and it had some issues too. Like it only played one episode and then the other ones wouldn't play. The bonus feature disc has plays okay. That doesn't have any issues. And I tested these other discs in uh, my on my computer and in other players and they still didn't work. So basically what HBO did is they fucked up and released some corrupted, faulty fucking discs for this set. And uh, I, I blame HBO for that. They fucked up. Now, I, apparently I'm not alone because there are some reviews on Amazon that talk about, I really like the show and I got it for my friend and he said one of the discs was messed up or then I got one for myself and my, one of the, then the first disc didn't work. So apparently it's one of those where it's a crapshoot. You could have the first disc work fine, but then you could have discs two and three not work at all. I mean, discs two and three work intermittently. And then you could have a set that works perfectly. And there's no way to fucking know if it works as a whole or not unless you buy it. Unless you buy it, then you know. If not, you're shit out of luck. So, I definitely wanted to rant on that because that that's lame. That's really shitty by HBO. Now, I definitely feel that also this should be on Blu-ray. This should get an upgrade. I would love to see an upgrade. Upgrade this to HD. Get this on Blu-ray. It would look fantastic. I mean, 
what are they waiting for? Uh, this this would be a perfect thing to release on Blu-ray before the release of the new Spawn series, the new Spawn film. So the picture quality is all right. The, the the picture quality is definitely better on this signature edition than it is on the original releases, and it's uncut, which is absolutely necessary because if you watch an edited version of this it's not even really worth watching so but yeah i just i just wanted to vent on that a little bit because i was just this just sucks now i gotta get a new set see if the discs work don't know if they do or not i won't know until i get it and put it in my player and if they don't work then i gotta buy another one it's just that's just a pain in the ass and there's no excuse for it because it's a manufacturing error. So, and I know I know it's not the discs being scratched because I checked it. None of them are scratched that much. There, there's no reason for it. But hey, it is what it is. First world problems at at its finest, right? But it's it still is pretty hellish. It really is. And speaking of hellish, I want to mention the few things that I felt that I, I personally would have liked this show to have done better or things that I felt could have been cut out of the show or so on and so forth. I spent all this time praising it and saying all these other things about it are great. And I did, I did definitely uh, talk about a few episodes that I wasn't really that keen on. But one thing I really think does not work with this series is Todd McFarlane's intros. Like He's just not cut out for this. It, it just doesn't work. He's not a good host. He doesn't have uh, that much of an on-screen presence or charisma. And also, what he's given to say is just this philosophical fortune cookie nonsense that it didn't really add that much to the series. I also felt that some of the edits in, in the second and third season, especially in these intros, was just obnoxious with quick flash edits and stuff. And I'm not a fan of that at all. And thankfully, the series did not really rely on a lot of that editing to grab your attention. Otherwise, it would have gotten annoying real fast. And like I mentioned earlier, the score really could have been a lot better. I would have been nice to see a little bit more of Spawn doing a few more things like using his cloak more, using his chains more, doing a few things. You see his chains, but it would have been nice to see a little more variety with Spawn. Have him use his, uh, his um, he has these, uh, these, green, the, these green energy powers. Have him use those more often. I think he uses it once or his eyes glow green once, but that's about it. So it be, would have been nice to see him use that more in in the series and like i said you know punch up the climax you know make it a little bit more of a of a satisfying climax but then again it's they i don't i don't think they planned on this ending after season three you can tell with the way season three and the season three ends like the other seasons did where it's building up to another season and you didn't get another season so what you're left with is a cliffhanger which is definitely not that satisfying. But, yeah, I mean, other, other than those few things, uh, I, st I think this is a top-notch, top-flight show. It, it, it's, it is really a wonderful, awesome animated series that I cannot recommend highly enough. So either take a risk, get this set, hope all the discs work, or check it out on Amazon Prime, or check out the uh, the show on YouTube. Like people have actually posted the the show on YouTube, so um, it's what it's widely available, readily available for people to check out, and um, I I definitely recommend that you do. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this. I know it's a longer video than usual uh, when it comes to my usual reviews, but I had like 18 episodes to talk about and an entire mini series to discuss, and I wanted to discuss it as in depth as I possibly could. So anyway, I uh, hope you all enjoyed it.
And now, Spawn, turn off your lights.